What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Blue River Bow Hunting Podcast, Spring Thunder Part Four. Got, got my buddy Paul Campbell on from Ohio. What's going on, man? Brett, what's good, man? You feeling all right? Yeah, I'm feeling good, man. Uh, finally got the man cave put back together. You commented yeah. on on Twitter. You know, it feels good to have my setup back together and uh, yeah. definitely ready to talk some turkey with you. There you go. I, I am. This is my my second day in my man cave down here. It uh, so. I've got like sound panels ordered because it's like, I don't know, I feel echoey in here, but there's nothing on the walls other than this old duck blind netting that I had laying around. Other than that, there's there's, there's literally like two brick walls and two just plain white walls down here. So it's like a dungeon. <laughs> That's awesome. But so, you inspired me. Oh, hell yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah, uh, you have to get you some turkey fans up there one day. Yeah, I, I do. I've got them all. My, my son's got a couple and... Uh, I have a bunch of them in like a, like a paper Kroger sack Mm -hmm. that I have it. I just need to like, I need to mount, I need to fan them out and mount them. And there's just the sacks like full of turkey fans and beards and feet. So (laughs) just, yeah. Well, uh, introduce yourself. Maybe somebody that this is Paul's second time on the show. Maybe introduce yourself a little bit. So somebody that doesn't know you. Yeah. So I, I, I live, uh, born and raised in central Ohio. Um, I have a, a podcast that airs on the Sports Sense Nation. A friend of mine, Andrew Montz, and I host the show. It's called the O2 Podcast, the Ohio Outdoors Podcast. So we've been doing that since uh, August of 2021. That's been a lot of fun. We've got um, – I work for the NWTF. I, I'm, I'm a director of development for the East Central region, so I, I, get, uh, I get to meet a ton of really cool people. I cover the state of Indiana, where you're from. Yep. Um, I love it, man. I, I get uh, I get to drive around and meet people and talk about turkey hunting, talk about research, talk about the NWTF and raise money, and I couldn't be happier with that. But um, so yeah, I've been I've been hunting for uh, I don't know probably 15 years now at this point, and uh, turkey hunting is it, man. That is that is that's what makes me tick. Just as a human being, it's what me tick. You know, makes me tick as a as a person. So it's my favorite thing to do, without a doubt. If you haven't checked the the his his show out the, the O2 podcast, check it out. Especially if you're into turkey hunting, they've had some incredible guests on there. Uh, talk a little bit who you have on. You've had Dave Owens and Scott Ellis and yeah, Dave Dave Owens, Scott Ellis uh, have been on. Scott Ellis did a master class on turkey calling, which was 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 fantastic. We've got uh, Fred Bird coming up. Um, did a really good episode with us about. Uh, about turkey hunting and just kind of the NWTF and, and, the, and the and the culture and heritage around turkey hunting, uh, which was it was it was a really good show. Uh, we've got Josh Carney coming up, um, the son of the South. We've got uh, Fred Hill is a guy from from Tennessee. Not many people know about, but he might be one of the most accomplished public land turkey hunters on the face of the planet. I mean, the, the dude is awesome. Just a really good guy. Um, funny as hell. So those make for the best conversations. The people that. Uh, nobody's heard of, you know, they start spitting some yeah. knowledge out there and you're like, Oh wow, this guy really knows what he's talking about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. The guy, man, he's just, and he, he's ate up with it, man. He's one of those guys. He hits the ground running in the spring and hunts as many States as he can. And, uh, yeah, we had, a, we had about 10 minute conversation. I'm like, damn, dude, you I can talk to you for hours, man. Keep talking. So, yeah, so that's, that's been cool. <laughs> we've done, um, we've had the, the DNR biologist from Ohio on twice. Uh, this year to talk about kind of the the turkey numbers in the state of Ohio and where we're where we're at uh, with population wise in, in the state. So that's been really good. So yeah, awesome. turkey content's been pretty pretty fun, man. Pretty cool. Absolutely. This is my my fourth show for turkeys, and it's getting me fired up. I'm ready to go get on some long beard. So let's uh, let's dive into it a little bit. Tell us sure. how you started, how you got started in turkey hunting. So I didn't. I never hunted a day in my life. Um, I was in early mid twenties, so this would have been 2007, 2008, sometime around there, and um, probably 2008 rather. And uh, I, I was in just a really bad place in life. My my dad had just died. The economy was absolute trash, and I was in a free fall, man. Personally, professionally, emotionally, physically, everything. Just my, my I was a, a total mess, and. My best friend at the time, his dad had, had always deer hunted and turkey hunted, but he had never turkey hunted. And he said, Hey, do you want to go? Do you want to go turkey hunting? You want to try this out? And I'm like, the hell's wild turkey. I, didn't, I had no idea what it was. I didn't know that people did such a thing. So I bought the cheapest Walmart camo I could get. I borrowed a shotgun and uh, we headed down south to uh, to some 
public land in southern Ohio and didn't kill a turkey, didn't see one. All we, we heard one turkey gobble the entire year. And that turkey gobble changed something to me, man. Something clicked. I, I, I wanted to see that animal and I wanted to kill it. Like for when it just, just being honest, you know, I like, I, I was so focused and so hooked on that. I just had that one gobble, man. It just it, something clicked in my mind. I spent the rest of the summer. I would go down after season and I would just sit in the woods and I would listen to turkeys communicate and, and, uh, you know, just try to figure out how to move in the woods, you know? And, uh, it took me three years to kill my first turkey. So that's awesome. It's a hell of a day. Oh, absolutely. Uh, talk about hunting Ohio and, and the heritage of um, turkey hunting on Ohio. I know I kind of steal that from you a little bit. You know, I love when you get somebody on the show and you guys are always talking about heritage and stuff. And that I've been asking that, you know, on my show as well. I love mm-hmm. hearing the heritage is from each state. Yeah, it's the, the, the heritage of Ohio runs runs deep, man. Uh, for, for not just turkey hunting, but deer hunting and, and uh, you know, some duck hunting. The the heritage I, I feel like for all turkey hunters started in the fall you know a lot of states didn't have a spring season and the fall hunters were the ones that really drove kind of the evolution of turkey hunting in general and a lot of those guys are still around and i get to talk to them in my in my job you know these guys were like well yeah i i, I, I hunted the first spring season in 1966 i'm like holy shit that's cool and cool. uh the, the 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 heritage you know side I'm, I'm fascinated with kind of like the uh the social side of hunting you know how people people interact with hunting um and how it and how it moves their lives and how and how people you know, not just the enjoyment of the physical exercise but like the reason we do it you know and everybody's reason is different and in some people it's not as personal as it is for for some you know like turkey hunting for me is a very personal thing it's a very important thing to me and other people do it just because they like the exercise and they like to eat wild turkeys or eat venison, whatever it may be. So, you know, the heritage here in the state, it's deep. Um, and, and it's just the surrounding states too, you know, just dealing with all these people, man, you, you see how, how important turkey hunting is to a massive amount of people. And I love it, man. I, I eat it up. I enjoy the shit out of it. So <laughs> absolutely. I do too. Yeah. I've never gotten to turkey hunt Ohio. I got the deer hunt it last year. But... We're going to change that. Yeah, let's change that for sure. So talk a little bit about the opportunities, um, you know, definitely for like public land and stuff that, that the state of Ohio presents. So the state of Ohio um, as a whole is probably, and it's in the bottom 10% of public land availability in the entire country. So we have, I, I want to say it's less than 6% of our total land mass is public hunting. And so that's, that's on the lower side. I mean, I, I believe that's like half of what Indiana has, um, yeah. and compared to some of our other, other states, we are, you know, the bottom, bottom of the barrel. That being said, we do have, um, you know, we have some good property to, to Turkey hunt in Ohio. Uh, the DNR has done a really nice job. They came up with a program called the Ohio land access, uh, partnership program. And it's basically landowners get paid $30 an acre to open their property to Hunter. So as a hunter, you can go on to the website, the DNR runs, sign up, get a permit online, and you have access to private property for a 24 hour or, you know, from, from legal hunting hours only. So it's, um, so they're doing a good job. The DNR is doing a a good thing. And it's just, you know, just the NWTF in Ohio, the department of wildlife just bought uh, 1600 acres in Southern Ohio to add on to another wildlife management area. So that's really good. They, They are trying they've acknowledged that they've, they've done a pretty bad job of it, but, uh, there's, there is still some access and there's a lot of opportunity for, uh, for hunters. So my biggest complaint that I have, and I have, I'll I'll bring this up with anyone at the DNR is we'll have a, you know, a 30,000 acre wildlife management area and there's nine places to park in the entire area, you know? So all, you know, all of those parking areas are full of people. Because, you know, you, you park and you walk, you know, and, but you'll drive by a 6,000 acre chunk of property 
and there's nowhere to park. You can't pull off the way the gravel roads are. You know, you're just going to either block traffic or get stuck. And man, I, it drives me nuts. And I complain about it whenever I get a chance. So, <laughs> yeah, that was a uh, when I went over there deer hunting. You know, we did run into that. A lot of people yeah. over there, in, you know, in those parking spots, and you know, some of those uh, gravel roads that you're traveling on over there, man. Those, I mean, it's it could be pretty rough. There were spots where we didn't yeah. even know if we could get through there. We had a pulled a enclosed trailer behind us and some of it was washed out and everything oh yeah yeah you get trees down and and uh it can get sketchy in some of those in some of those areas so yeah they they uh they the state of ohio i'd like to see you know make a few more parking spots in the wildlife <laughs> there. i'm not asking much so. <laughs> that's awesome uh talk about turkey number as far as population goes what kind of numbers are you guys looking at so Ohio, we just in, in September of 2021, uh, the state announced that they were reducing the spring harvest from two gobblers uh, per person to one gobbler per person in the spring season of 2022. That was due to a three consecutive years of below average pulp production, pulp survival rate. So, and this is where it gets kind of confusing for a lot of people in the state. They made that. They made that uh, that decision to drop it from from two to one. They proposed to drop three three weeks off the fall season in 2022. 2021, the pulp production and pulp survival rate per head was above average. It was one of the highest pulp pr production pulp survival rates that we've ever had. So, some people were like, "Well, and it's it's definitely a preventative measure that the state has put in that the biologists um, you know, through the state of Ohio have decided would be would be good." I support it hundred percent. I think anything that, that we can do as hunters to, to help the wild Turkey, if that's sacrificing, you know, a year or two of, of taking two toms, uh, in the state, so be it, you know, I want to be able to hunt turkeys when I'm 75, if I'm still alive, you know, absolutely. So I'm willing to sacrifice, you know, some, 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 I guess, access and, uh, and privileges for that. So, but other than that, I, you know, I, I feel like, you know, I've talked to the biologist. He said there's never been more turkeys in the state of Ohio. You may not see them, but they are there. There's never been more. This is the highest population in the state of Ohio that we've ever had. So that, I feel awesome. good about that. I feel good about the direction. Yeah, definitely. I saw, um, I don't know if it came across my email. It came across something maybe on LinkedIn or something like that. But the NWTF was reaching out for applications for like helping out on research and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so the so the NWTF has done has done and does a ton of research projects within all of the states that, that we're involved in, which is all fifty states. No research, obviously, in Alaska, but there's research is definitely it's kind of a buzzword for for people now. It's 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 um, you know it's picked up. People want to see the numbers. They want to see because you know as hunters we say, well, I didn't see turkeys, I didn't hear gobbles. This is the the smallest amount of turkeys that you know that have ever been here, and people want answers. They want to know what's going on, and I feel, and this is just a personal opinion. I feel like turkeys, man. I feel like they walk a razor's edge, yeah. And at any moment, they could just go either either direction, you know, and be, Definitely. you know, go trend up or cut their legs off and trend down for decades, you know. And there's been a ton of work that has been done over you know the last fifty years to reintroduce the wild turkey and get them to where they're at. So it's just, I think at this point it's, it's about owning, when I say owning, like you, know, you and I, public land hunters, uh, private property owners, wildlife managers, biologists, owning the things that we need to do to help the wild turkeys and understanding them. That's where the research comes. So there's a ton of projects going on in Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, West Virginia, PA, my area, ton of work going on. So that's awesome. I, I I wouldn't mind, you know, being a part of that sometime. Just yeah. maybe, you know, checking it out. Maybe get to film them doing their thing or whatever. Like when I had Team Wingbone on a couple of weeks ago, and they were talking about uh, working with the biologists and you know, get watching them use the net gun and you know, putting the the collars on them and everything yeah. like that. I find that super interesting. It is, and it's it's uh, it's it's such a valuable resource. You know, the biologists that we have in this country, not just, you know, NWTF and, you know, the universities, but I mean, man, they are, they are so good at what they do. And I think it's just coming down to listening to those folks, you know, the, the people that, that live and breathe 
you know, the research side of the, of the wild turkey. So yeah, I'd love to see some of that. I've got some, some stuff that, you know, I'm going to meet with some of the WTF biologists and, and just and do the same thing, uh, you know, video it. And I want to, in my job and my personal life, professional life, I really want to understand everything that goes into the actual conservation of the wild turkey. So. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Talk a little bit about like when you when you first started hunting and, and learning to call and, and learning the language. What kind of steps and progressions did you go through? So the first turkey call that I ever bought, I bought a Primo's Power Crystal. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Absolutely. One. Sold, yeah. Okay. I think everyone. I think every turkey hunter <laughs> in America is familiar with that call. I bought it at Walmart. It was probably ten bucks, and I. This is the, this is, so this, you know, this is before YouTube, this is before Facebook and Instagram. And I mean, there were like a couple chat rooms, you know, like, you know, on the web that, that you right. can get into. I wasn't real familiar with that stuff. So I buy this power crystal and Brent, I didn't realize that you had to rough the surface up to get the call. <laughs> and, and my, and my buddy had never hunted either. And so for, for, you know, I bought this, I bought this call, you know, probably a month before season starts for two weeks. I couldn't figure out how to get this damn turkey call to work. And it would just sound awful. And I'm like, eh, it doesn't sound like what you're supposed you know, what you're telling me it's supposed to sound like. So after some trial and error, I figured it out, rough the surface up. The biggest thing for me and, you know, no YouTube, you know, so you couldn't listen to a sound file was just getting into the woods and listening to the, to the wild turkeys communicate. And, that's just still, that's a, that's a, that's an ongoing process. You know, I, I can't say how many times, like you hear a hen yelping or cutting and you're like, oh dude, there's a hunter. That sounds like trash. Like this guy can't even call what the hell. And then you're just sitting there and then three hens walk by and you're like, oh crap. That's what they sound like. They, <laughs> I, I don't say anything like that. You know, like that sounded awful. And it's like, it's a real deal, you know? Yeah. So it's always fun. I, like when, when, what you're talking about, you know, you hear him cutting up and stuff and, uh, you know, they pop in and they, and they do it real close, you know, and you can really get that, uh, that sound that, you, you know, you get familiar with it. And then, you know, that helps you become a better caller, you know, like, yeah. Hey, I need to sound like this, you know, yeah, especially if sure. there's something behind him that's all fired up, you know, exactly what he wants to hear. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I can't use a mouth call. Everyone, I feel like wants to use a mouth call. That's the, you know, the greatest call in the world. Um, I have like the worst gag reflex in the world, man. <laughs> and you know what? Damn it! I buy a mouth call every year. But I go, look, look, look at this. I just bought this. I don't need this. I can't use this. And every year I'm like, this is it. This is the one. This is the year. I'm gonna buy. A, I'm gonna buy a ten dollar mouth call. I put this in probably two hours before we hopped on this call. Gagged, cried, tears in my eyes, threw it on the ground. I'm like, you know what? I'm never doing it again. I will. I, next 2023 absolutely buying a mouthful what up you know speaking so, of you know when i had the guys on from um from from wingbone have you ever tried yeah, a wingbone absolutely i got two well i i've got um i've made wing bones and 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 used them we if we're talking like a little dump fest i think these are two calls that i started using the last couple of years just trump you know this is a trumpet this is a just a cane call yep and uh you know i use them pretty regularly and I'm getting better at them. I feel like it's one of those call types that I've had this about, this will be my fourth season with them. Um, I feel like it takes 10 years to be good at a wing bone or a trumpet. Like those wing team wing, well, those guys are real good. Them guys are so, unbelievable. I hope yeah. they hear this, us talking about them because I want to, I don't want one of those. I want one of what they got. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> those, things, those things are, those things are good, man. And they, and they run real well. So, yeah, I, I, I try to run, you know, I can, you know, I, years ago, like I said, I couldn't, couldn't run a mouth call. I stopped trying to do it. So I just started using the box call. I started using friction calls, pot calls and stuff. So, you know, I had some, some, some guy tell me years ago, he's like, you know, I can guarantee that a well-run box call has killed more turkeys than any call on the face of the planet. And he's probably right. You know, it's hard to quantify that, but you know, wing bones and, and box calls, they're probably the, the biggest killers in the woods if I had to guess. So is there a particular brand that, or company that you like using, or is it just, you know, whatever sounds good to you, that's what you're going to run with. So I go through, I go through phases and I have, I have dozens of turkey calls. And, you know, when I first started, it was, you know, Primo's and Zinc and, and, you know, the bone collector, the, you know, the calls that you get, 
you know, at the big box stores. Then I started buying stuff that like I'd find at like these little shops, you know, like the little gas stations out in the middle of nowhere in Ohio or Tennessee. And, you know, some guy made them in his garage and I got a ton of those. They all sound great. I started and, you know, I don't want to sound like, like a snob here, but I started buying Woodhaven calls, you know, a couple years ago and I've, I've kind of stuck with them, but, uh, you know, I'll, I'll pick up, I'll pick up anything if it sounds good. And honestly, man, I think the, you know, a lot of the turkeys that I've killed have come off of like a $40 Zanks Lee call. It'd probably be like my number one call that I've used. And so, I completely agree with you. That's probably my number one go-to. I can't remember the exact name of it, but it's it's a slate call from Z. Or something like that. Yeah, something like that. And, I, and I've had it for years, and I've killed yeah. multiple birds with that thing. And, yeah. and I, I use their, their mouth calls and stuff too, but, man, I don't know. Woodhaven's got them mouth calls figured out. Uh, I don't know yeah. if it's Scott doing his thing or whatever. I have a couple Scott Ellis, you know, um, signature series I, and, and i love you know like like you were talking me and you were texting the other day when you went to the the show in columbus you can go to those shows and, and see those smaller brands and smaller companies and they make some great product i, I can remember yeah. i have a a box call from they're called morning wood is what their oh, brand nice. was but <laughs> but they made some good stuff, man. And I, I don't know. I, I'm like you. I love buying calls all the time. My we, my wife may well, not like my bank account when turkey season comes yeah. in because I'm always buying like 15 mouth calls and yeah. you know all that. But I I love the the whole aspect of calling and being able to, to talk their language. It's 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 why yeah, I fell sure. in love with turkey hunting. Really. Yeah. Yeah. It's so it's so. I mean, you can really dive deep into it. You know. And I, I asked Dave Owens, I said, do you have to be a good turkey caller to kill a turkey? It was basically the question. And he said, man, you don't even need a turkey call to kill a turkey. <laughs> right. You know, like if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're in close enough and you know where they're at, like you're going to kill a turkey. It definitely helps. I mean, that's, that's for sure. So it definitely makes it fun. <laughs> yeah, for sure. It, it does. <laughs> what about uh, some preseason scouting? What exactly are you doing preseason or in the off season to scout for turkeys? So, I, I look for turkeys year round. Um, I do it when I'm deer hunting. I do it when I'm duck hunting. I look for birds. I look for sign about February and most of it's just cabin fever. Deer season's over, duck season's over. Um, I'll start going out to, to the areas that I hunt. And I don't, I don't, I, I refuse to yelp at a turkey before the season. Yeah. So I'll just listen. I'll bring out hooters. I'll bring crow calls, stuff like that. Um, I, I get in, I'll look for, you know, look for scratching. I, I'm a creature habit, man. I I've got like 10 areas that I hunt in the state of Ohio and I go to those 10 every year, you know, and it's because of, you know, the previous 15 years I've done all that scouting work, you know, I get in and you know, kind of figure out where they're going, where they're roosting food sources, root, you know, all that stuff. Um, just recently I've started trying to do, uh, some e-scouting for, for new areas. There's a guy that has a podcast, uh, Parker McDonald, Southern Ground Hunting. He calls it New Spot Monday. So every Monday he goes to a new spot that he's never been to. I'm like, man, that's a really good idea. That is an excellent tip. Yeah. So I've, I've started, I've been on Onyx a lot this winter looking for new spots to, you know, to e-scouting, looking for, you know, parking access, looking, you know, how far away is this, uh, is this property from, you know, a city center, how far you know, how many parking spots can I actually see or noted on, on Onyx and, you know, water and, and river bottoms and, you know, points and fingers, and all the terrain and everything. So I've got a bunch penned out. I, you know, I talk to my buddy that we do a lot of hunting together. I'm like, I didn't want to go to those places this year, man. I, I've got these five that I want to try out. That's where I want to go when we first hit the ground. I don't, you know, old reliable. Let's just, let's just skip them, you know? So. All right. <laughs> But well, if I get, get three or four days down here in turkeys, you, you damn better believe I'm going to be right back in. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> the home base. So you know you get so comfortable with because you know if you hunt an area like you said, 15 years, you're going to know kind of where they're going to work or where they're roosting at or, you yeah. know, whatever. And they can make you comfortable sometimes. And, and they'll, them turkeys are going to put a whooping on you because you're getting comfortable. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> they Every definitely time. whoop me. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's amazing how, like, you can have a game plan. And I and I, I feel like this can with deer, the pheasant, whatever it is. But I feel like it happens a hell of a lot more with turkeys. You could know the exact tree that that turkey's in. You could sneak into the woods, completely silent, not bust him out, and have 
zero percent chance of shooting that turkey. <laughs> like that, that turkey's gonna hit the ground and just make a fool out of you and just walk out of your life, you know, and you're just sitting there going, What the hell? Like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what yeah, just happened. So this big game plan and it goes out, you know, five yeah. minutes after he hits the ground. <laughs> yeah, and that's why it's so fun, you know. Oh, definitely. It's, so interesting. it's definitely it's 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 a battle, man, every time every time you go out. So definitely. What about roosting birds uh, of an evening time? Is that something that you like to do? I've done it. I've done it a few times. I will say I usually do it like out of desperation when, uh, when you know, it's like the third week of season. I'm like, oh, God, man, like I need to, I need to make something happen. So I'll go out and I'll, I'll roost, uh, I'll roost turkeys. And it's worked out before in the past. So, you know, I just have to say like for just, just for me, more times than not, it's not very fruitful. And it's not that I won't hear turkeys in the evening. It's just that, like getting into them, getting set up, you know, I mean, like there was, this was the last day of season a couple of years ago, my son killed a bird. And uh, so the night before we go out, we roost, I literally watched this turkey fly up into a tree. I, I watched it and we go up, we get set up about four yards and this turkey pitches right down to us. I mean, it hits the ground 20 yards from us, stretches his neck, gobbles, my son shoots right over his head. Oh, I mean, right over his head. So I mean, I was I look at him. I'm like, I don't know what more you want me to do, man. Like, <laughs> and that was the, that was the only time, like in my in my turkey hunting career, that the roosting actually worked out like that well. And I feel like roosting birds, like it's going to give you the advantage. Okay, I know where I need to be in the morning. I don't know exactly where I need to be, but I have a pretty good idea. You're you're definitely going to have a leg up, and man, that's what it's about is being trying to be one step ahead of that bird that quite honestly is smarter than you at this point, you know? So <laughs> right. that we went to a, a Missouri last year, me and um, my buddy Ryan and another buddy of mine, Wayne. And that was kind of like, the, I know this sounds crazy. It was almost like the highlight of, of my trip, like each, each night. Cause you can only hunt till noon or you have yeah. to be out of the woods at one o'clock or whatever in Missouri. So like we'd go back to, you know, take that, you know, uh, early afternoon turkey nap you know wake up go grab a little something to eat or whatever and drive back out to the property and you know hit them right there at at, at dark or whenever they got up in the roost and my buddy wayne he's a hell of a, a hoot out does it with his mouth and everything we had them birds all fired up and then drive yeah. around to the next block and try to you know do it i don't know i have a lot of fun roosting the birds it can be yeah. you know throw a couple beers in the back of the truck and head out yes sir <laughs> Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a lot of fun. It's um, I mean, I know I know guys that they won't turkey hunt in the morning without roosting turkeys. So right. What about you know? I've asked this your uh, version four of this uh, spring turkey talk. Walk me through a day or a hunt with you. Like, how does it start? How are you progressing? I mean, from getting your morning coffee to head into the house that say it's over yeah. with walk me yeah, through so that. I, I am a psychopath when it comes to <laughs> um, I shut my brain off for 30 days in Ohio I'm a terrible father I'm a terrible husband I'm a terrible co-worker I'm a terrible employee friend all of it I am like so <laughs> laser focused and I tell my wife I'm like it's 30 days you know I might hunt 15 of those if I'm lucky you know, right. so I am, I am definitely an early riser when it comes to turkey hunting. When, when I'm, when I'm hunting, you know, my home range, if you will, I've got about an hour drive. So I usually wake up about two, most, most days, you know, weekend, weekday, doesn't matter. Uh, wake up, you know, two, I'm on the road at two thirty, two forty five, And I, I cover a lot of ground when I get there. I do not like being around other people turkey hunting. I mean, no one does drive me nuts. Makes me mad. Like literally, like just just infuriates me. It's not because I think that it's mine. It's just because I don't want to see other people. I want to see the woods. That's all I want to see. I, I want to be like completely isolated, you know. Right. And so I'm super nice to people. And I'm the guy like, if I get to a public land spot and there's five people, where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Where are you going? Good. I'm gonna go that way. Good luck to you guys. Love you all. And I'm out. You know. Right. But so I get. I get to real early, man. I want to be the first truck there. I want to be the last truck out. Um, I'd say on average, like I've got a couple spots that I hunt pretty, pretty re religiously, um, four to seven miles minimum. You know, I think the, the most that I've ever walked from the truck was 17 miles for a turkey hunt. Um, one way. Yeah, that was insane. I mean, 
I was 25. I'm 40 now. There's zero <laughs> chance that I'm doing that now. But um, so, so for me, like if I just say, you know, we'll just say I'm, 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 I'm in Indiana the first time. I'm going to look for that highest point that I can possibly find. And then we go right to it, wherever it may be, you know, and, uh, and that just comes from that East Scouting. So I'm going to get that highest point. And I'm just going to listen, man. I, I like to get in the woods at like at least an hour and a half before sunrise, maybe, maybe even earlier. You know, if it's if, if if I'm dealing with a lot of pressure, I'm going to get there two hours before and I'm going to get as far away from people as I can. Um, and I, I usually go with I'm going to let the woods wake up. That's kind of my that's always been my move. I want to hear what the birds are going to do um, if they're not talking, you know, and it's 20 minutes before sunrise or 15 minutes before sunrise or you know, the time that I think that they should be making noise. And you know what time that is. It's like when you can see when you can see 20 yards away, finally, you know, the sun's coming up enough, but it's not sunrise and they should be gobbling. Then I'll out and see and see where they're at. Um, and if I have to move, that's it, man. I'm hitting that, like, I'm going as fast as I can, you know, cause I know they're on the tree. This might, this is like the easiest time for me to get there and not scare them is right now. So let's, you know, let's, let's get there and figure it out. So right. I guess that's kind of the, the jumping off point, you know, for, for how my day starts. Um, I drink a ton of coffee too. If we're talking about like the nitty gritty, I ate a ton of coffee. <laughs> yeah. So it was funny. I went through my, I went through my turkey vest for the first time since turkey season. And I, there was a coffee mug in there. I've literally, I've been looking for since <laughs> last June and it was in my turkey vest. I'm like, oh, son of a bitch. There it is. <laughs> there it is. So awesome. yeah, take it with me. Yeah, I go through a lot of, uh, and I probably shouldn't, not very healthy for me, but I definitely go through a lot of energy drinks during turkey season to get yeah. me through that, you know, 1030 to one o'clock range. You get, get me woke up, you know? Yeah. I nap. I'm not going to, I'm not going to lie. I, I will, especially if I'm by myself, if, if like you and I were hunting, I would nap. Cause yeah, I, I'm just, I want to get you a turkey. You know what I mean? But, yeah. uh, if it's no, just me and sure. I'm solo, <laughs> Oh, dude, I'll eat, I'll eat a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and eat like six Slim Jims and just <laughs> oh, yeah, for an hour and a half, you know. So I, there's no shame in my game, man. Too bad we couldn't uh, take a whole box of those wings we had the other day and take those oh, out yeah, of the turkey. Yeah, those are pretty, those are pretty damn good. Those were good. Yeah. Um, talk about how uh, the weather affects birds, especially an eastern bird. So... I know there's there's been a lot of research that says that the barometer or barometric pressure will make turkeys gobble. So it's uh, I think it's a, an increase of barometric pressure will make them gobble. I don't know, man. I always say if it's nice out, they're probably gonna <laughs> they're probably gonna be gobbling. It's not always the case, you know. And so in my talk with Dave Owen, he you know he he brought up this great point, and I'm gonna try it out this year. And he's like, listen to the woods, listen to the songbirds, listen to the crows, listen to the owls, listen to all the other animals. If they're silent, for whatever reason it, it, it makes them silent, turkeys are going to be quiet. And I've never thought about that to listen to, you know, the other birds, the other animals in, in, in the woods. So for, for me, it doesn't matter what the weather is. If it's my only day to hunt, you know, that week, it could be a foot of snow. I'm going to be out there. Poor rain. I'm going to be out there. That old saying, I hate it. You can't kill them from the couch, but it's true, you know. Right. Um so I think I think for me too as a, as a as a pot call and box call guy when it rains I'm like oh god so I have this like huge two and a half gallon bag right like like a Ziploc bag that I put my my box calls in to keep them dry and then I call inside I hold it up in the air so the rain and I call inside of the bag that's awesome yeah to do it because like with with the trumpets when like when you're when you're wet and this thing's wet, like there's no seal on it, so it doesn't it doesn't work. So I have to do I have to do my turkey calling inside of a plastic zip. Like so. <laughs> I killed and, my, my my biggest bird. I killed was in a down absolute downpour yeah. in Kentucky. And you know how they say you know when when it rains like that, you know the the woods with the wind and the rain and stuff. You know it scares them, so they get into you know open fields. And yeah. I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and put the old hammer down. Yeah, there you go. You gotta, you gotta love that. And you know, I, I'd say one of the most active days that I've ever—it didn't result in a kill that I've that I've had in the woods. It was probably twenty degrees, and I mean, it was twenty. It was bitter cold. It was going to warm up pretty quick, but man, there was something. Those birds were fired up. I mean, it was, and it's just 
who the hell knows why they gobble, man? I don't know why they don't. You know, I, I, I have no idea. So, well, well, you know, you just let the the cat out of the bag a little bit, <laughs> literally. But the, uh, you know, talking about the plastic bag in your turkey vest, what's all in your turkey vest? Everything but the kitchen so, sink. <laughs> everything but the kitchen sink. So you you sent you sent over just some talking points. So I went through and I I emptied out my turkey vest and That's it's awesome. sitting on my desk right here. And I, I got everything. I mean, it's 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 amazing, man. I I want to I want to just I just want to show you this. Look at all that. Dang. That's all from my. There's my my dungeon of a room. That's all from. I mean, <laughs> like this is this is just absurd, man. These are the strikers that I bring into the woods with me. Every oh time yeah. I'm and with I, you. Man. Honestly, like, I probably have ten times this, and I'll switch them out left and you know, oh, yeah, this one sounds better, and I'll take them. This is just what I ended into the season with. with you know, last time I went, but yeah, cause different whatever, wood with different calls, you know, can yeah, make different volumes and pitches yeah. and it all sounds di- vastly different. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And and that's like, as, as I've grown as a turkey caller, you know, like Scott Ellis talked about it, realism, realism, realism. Um, I really started to listen to the nuances of my calling and the nuances of sounding like different, different hens in the woods guys that can that can run a mouth call really easy or really well that's an easy thing to do you know pop it in pop it out but we got i mean even even good guys good callers can sound like five different hands with one call right. i can't do that you know uh, with the different call types the, or the striker types the different you know pot calling services i can definitely sound like like multiple hands but yeah got my got my my out hooters i got my crow call i got uh the three these are the three pot calls that i that i use religiously the last couple of years just a slate glass over glass and then i bought this the woodhaven per pot i don't know if you're familiar yep, with this thing absolutely nasty unbelievable oh, so real 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 good sounding call and it's 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 fairly fairly reasonably priced i mean turkey calls can get really expensive but Yeah, that easy. Great. I love that thing. So, what about like your, what about your vest? What kind of vest do you have? It's a it's a Cabela's Tactical Tater that I bought in like 2008, yeah. and I've I've bought maybe five turkey vests since then. I'd say of those five that I bought, one of them I actually hunted with. The other one, like, I don't like this. And I go back to this Tactical Tater every time. You know, it, and until been... it rips, I'll never change. Yeah, I'm with you, man. I've I've been turkey hunting since I was 14. I'm be turning 33 this year, and I'm on my second vest, and I don't need I don't, I don't need any more, man. I, I it it does its purpose. The seat on it is pretty comfortable. Which I was going to ask you if you if you use a chair any. I I love using the chair, and then with my vest, I'm even more comfortable. And um, you know, I got pockets for everything. I can fit my Gatorade and you know Slim Jims, like you were saying, and you know, yeah. sandwiches, and you know, and I'm still s- stealthy enough where I can still move move through the woods with it. So I, I don't yeah, see sure. see an upgrade in my future anytime soon on turkey vest. No, I don't. I don't. Uh, I you know, Primos came out with that Will Primos turkey vest this year, and I checked that thing out, and it is nice, man. I mean, it is real nice. But I put it on, I'm like, eh. Yeah, it's not that much better. And it is. Like it's way more. Yeah, it's, it's a lot nicer. There's a lot more features, but it's just I've i that that best and I man, we've been through we've been through a lot. You know, Definitely. there's been a lot of blood in it, and you know, it's just like a friend at this point. You know, so I think <laughs> at some point when it starts to fall apart, I'll just retire and hang it on the wall behind me or something. All right. But, uh, I think I end up giving my first one to somebody that was like getting into it, and I was trying to be nice and like, here, you take this. I'm gonna yeah. go buy me a new one, and then. That was a long time ago, and I still haven't bought a new one. Which, yeah. you know, turkey season such a short period of time. Like you said, sure. thirty days, or you know, for Indiana, I think we got three weeks or something. You know, comparing that to to deer hunting, where I have, you know, several months that I'm going to sit in that stand or use a certain uh, clothing brand or whatever. You know, I, I'm using it a lot more than a turkey hunt. Like you said, you maybe get fifteen days uh, out of the year to hunt. You know, you're not going to get that much use out of it i mean you're going to obviously because you're going to hunt for hours on end but day days wise you're not going to put as much on that product 
Yeah, for sure. Yeah, if I was hunting out of it, you know, 70, 80 days a year, I would have gone through that fest, you know, five, 10 years ago, probably. But, but. <laughs> right. No, I love it. And to answer your other question, I do. I started hunting with a chair uh, 2020. That uh, was my first season in a chair, and I'll never go back. No, I won't yeah. ever go back. Those things are so comfortable, man. Yeah, the and it's funny the guys that I hunt with, they you know they make fun of me, and you know we'll set up on a turkey, and, and you know sometimes the turkeys, man, it takes like two or three hours for them to commit, you know, like and, and so you're just sitting there, and they'll I'll see them, you know, moving around and like standing up, and like oh, God, my butt hurts. I'm like, I'm I'm fine, man. Like I'm yeah, super I'm comfy. I got my feet <laughs> back, you know, and, and uh, so yeah, I. I'll never go back. It, it, it is kind of cumbersome. It is kind of inconvenient to carry it through the woods, but man, the payoff, I'll tell you what, that turkey, I killed turkey. Um, I bought that chair, like the third or fourth hunt I killed a turkey out of 2020. And it was the, it was the damnedest thing. man. I was like walking through the woods. This turkey must've been trailing me or something. Gobbles. I'm like, I'm deep into like waist deep and just weeds and just brush. Right. I mean, it's just like this, just green foliage. And it was kind of like this weird transition zone. There were kind of some scrappy trees kind of far away. And this bird's like 60 yards from me. I throw that chair down. And the only thing exposed is like chest up in those weeds. And I'm super comfortable. It took me maybe 30 minutes to work in, to, you know, finally commit before I killed him. That chair was instrumental in me being able to set up comfortably. The tree, you know, I, I, you know look at it, you know, the trees that were there, like I wouldn't have been able to set up and get, and get a good shot. So, you know, very, very useful for me. It's definitely worth it. Um, I love it. So oh, absolutely back. me too. I yeah, wouldn't we'll go, go back. back. What about uh decoys? Are you running any decoys or is it is it situ situational if you're using a decoy? Definitely situational for me, I guess. I, I, I don't use them very often. I'm not like preachy about it. If people want to use decoys and it's legal in your state, do it. The one thing I think that people need to to look into with decoys in their state, a lot of states have regulations that you cannot m manipulate the movement of that decoy. So you can't have like a string to it to move it. It just, it has to be wind. Um, so check your regulations, but here in Ohio, they don't care. Um, I've had it open fields, uh, you know, with decoys in there. Guys that are really good at turkey hunting, they're better than me. They'll hunt those open fields. And like Scott Ellis says, you hide the hen. So you go 40 or 50 yards back into the woods off that field, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I guess it's, it's situational for some. I don't really use them much. A lot of it is I don't want to carry it into the woods as Same. part of it. You know, I've got I've got enough to carry in. I mean, hell, you see, you saw my desk. <laughs> right. I'm about to start carrying a camera this year. Like the last thing I'm bringing in is a decoy bag. So yeah, that camera thing it it really changes your setup. You know what I mean? I'm sure. Yeah, but I'm sure. Being in that chair will definitely help you out. Um, yeah, from what I've experienced. Yeah. Um, yeah. hunting other states. Uh, yeah. what do you got lined up for? 2022 so i'll be i'm leaving for alabama next saturday um i'll be in alabama uh the first for, for five or six days then i'm headed to tennessee um then I'll, I'll come home for for a week or so i'm gonna go to kentucky for their opening opening weekend same okay which i think what is it, the 16th maybe yeah it is, is the it, 16th yep it's the 16th yeah so i'll be there um i'll be there you know, 16 17 18 Saturday, Sunday, Monday type deal, maybe Tuesday. Yeah, um, that's the same boat I'm in. It all depends okay. on how that, that weekend goes. If I take yeah. Tuesday, I already have Monday off. I'm taking, I'm actually taking Friday off too because I'm going to get down there Thursday night. It's only like a four hour drive for me. Okay. I, I'm going to get there. I, I'm going to get up early Friday morning, hit the spot, see what I hear, what I see. Gives me a, a day ahead kind of advantage type of thing. Yeah. And then, you know, Saturday, Sunday, and then Monday is what I have planned. But if it doesn't go as planned, I will stay an extra day or two. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Good. <laughs> it's hard to leave, man. It's 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 hard. It's hard to leave. So, yeah. After that, I'm going to be rolling into into Ohio for the opening season. You and I are going to do some some turkey hunting in Indiana. But yes, sir. After that, it's man. It's it's uh, it's West Virginia, PA, New York, down into New Jersey. Um, if I have time and the money available. Uh, I'm going to go to New Hampshire and, and maybe like the long shot is Maine. Um, I do have an event in Montana, um, that I'm going to hit for four days to do some Merriam hunting out there. But, uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that goes. So I've got, I've got a good, I've got a really good year. Man. I, 
I, you know, it's that the sounds most like a hell of a season. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like yeah. you get the whole East coast. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm going to be lucky. And, and, uh, I don't know, man, I, I hope I can manage my time, you know, well to, you know, to still work. And, and a lot of this is, is work related, you know, hunting with people that I work with, which is super cool, but you know, the podcast and just being a dad, you know, I got two little girls at home, you know, and, right. uh, I can't dump them off of my wife for, <laughs> for two full months of turkey on you just need she to knows like what's a, coming she's prepared she's been prepared since last fall when i started talking about it so. you need to just get like a winnebago and just roll out for like two yeah. three solid months of turkey hunting. yeah exactly. just take them like with Dave you does and all those guys and just yeah. come back you know, haggard and broke and <laughs> so be so worth yeah. it though <laughs> what about yeah, you know you talk good. about you know I've asked several people this question and I don't think they could do the detail like you'll do it. You know, you just talked about hunting like what 10 different States, if not that, you know, yeah. how do you plan that? How, how far ahead are you planning it? And what details are you going and planning on all those hunts? So I started, I started planning my, my out of state hunts. Um, probably like November of, of last year, I started looking we can get dates. Um, I'm real, you know, I hunt, I hunt mostly in public and, and it's because I, I just don't know, you know, people that own private land. So the one, one thing that I start doing, I'll look at like harvest data. Mm-hmm. So well, actually the first thing I look at is, okay, is it a lottery? You know, like Mississippi's a lottery for public land now. Um, I don't know if they call it a lottery. It might be something different. I can't, but yeah. So I look to see, you know, what the tag draw, you know, their tag draws, you know, uh, license requirements. Uh, and then I'll look at dates and then I go and I look at previous year's harvest data. So I'll go, we'll look at the top county. Okay. So we'll use a county in Ohio, Coshocton. We'll look at Coshocton. What public land is available in Coshocton? Zero. Okay. Well, what's the next county <laughs> down the line? So then I start looking and, you know, so I'll find a county. Okay. There's a decent amount of public, public land. How far away is it from a major city? And just going down those e scouting things that, that I talked about. So it's really weird. I've got, I have a file around here somewhere with all of the printouts of the harvest data from all the states that I'm hunting in, what management areas are there, what highways are off of, like I've got map dots everywhere. <laughs> it's just like, it's, That's you awesome. know, yeah. So I start, I start, I put, I put a lot of effort into it uh, late at night because that's something that, you know, if it's you know, five o'clock, my wife said, what are you doing? Oh, I'm analyzing harvest data from the last eight years in the state of Tennessee. She said, stop it. <laughs> yeah, you know, so, yeah, I'll do that shit in the middle of the night, you know. So, uh, so uh, talk about, you know, you you are able to harvest a bird. Mm-hmm. What are, you know, what are some ways that you like cooking wild turkey? Uh, I like smoking them, for sure. That's probably my favorite thing. I'll spatchcock them, um, which is you just cut the spine out of them, and they just, just kind of flop open. Mm-hmm. Um, so they'll smoke faster. I think they have, you, you, you get... Um, the full bird. I, I pluck the entire thing. Sometimes I'll skin it too, just because I'm, I always brine my turkeys. So salt water, um, you can throw in some herbs. Uh, I've done citrus brine, which is really good. So like grapefruit, oranges, um, lemons and limes, throw them in there with your, with your brine, let it sit for a day or two, always brine them. So if you skin them, you can, you can keep them pretty moist. If you're, if you're, if you're patient enough, um, you know, with the brine, but yeah, smoking is definitely my favorite, my favorite way. So I have seen some really good recipes where guys are like deep frying turkeys, like, yeah. uh, like, like chicken, like turkey strips. Oh, so yeah, I might, that's kind of what that. I do. That's yeah, I might do my that favorite, man. Yeah. Well, yeah. Kill a turkey with me and <laughs> we'll let's do fry it. Yeah. Some turkey, so. I'll show you a little secret. I'm not going to let that secret out, but I'll okay, show you a good it, way man. of frying it up. But um, yeah. I, that's probably my favorite deep frying the strips. Uh, but another way we found out was because I'm mostly a strips guy because I'm not okay. really a dark meat type, type of guy. I mean, I'll try it, you know, absolutely yeah. something, especially oh. something smoked. But putting the breasts in a crock pot with like uh, some Italian dressing, oh, letting yeah, it cook up, good. shredding it, and then adding barbecue sauce to it unbelievable like sandwiches yeah. oh my god oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's good. a reason why i'm fat <laughs> yes sir yeah that sounds good what about this is uh, i know that you're on a time sensitive schedule today so i'll skip a few of these but what about tips for um a beginning turkey hunter maybe they've never stepped in the woods before they're they're ready to to 
interact with a wild turkey and hunt them, what's some tips for them or one main tip maybe? I think I think the, the, the first thing that I would tell a new turkey hunter is you're going to fail and you're going to lose more times than you're going to win. And it's a mental game. It's a mental game every every year. And some people can can do really well at that, that mental game. And some people say, you know what, this just isn't for me. I don't like all the work that I just had to do for this. Or I don't like that, you know, I had a turkey at 55 yards and for whatever reason, he turned around and ran away. And it's because you moved your fingers or what, you know, whatever. Yeah, right. It's such a mental, turkey hunting, is, it's mentally taxing. And the number one thing I could say that someone that's getting into is just shut your brain down, man. Shut it down and focus on what's in front of you. And don't get discouraged. Learn from your failures. Um, I can't tell you how many times, and I, I do it all the time. And I'm sure you do too. I'm sure a lot of people listen to the show do. You'll do something wrong. You'll stand up and go, well, I'm not doing that again. <laughs> right. And I will say that you know, 30 times a year, deer hunting, duck hunting, turkey, squirrel, doesn't matter. But I'm not doing that again. Because <laughs> that's the best way you learn. You learn by failure, you know? So Definitely. Learn, learn by failure. Keep your head up. Stay focused. Um, the biggest thing that I think that I think is going to help people be successful in the woods is learning how to communicate effectively with turkeys and learning how they communicate with each other and just listening to them. You know, Scott Ellis made a point to me, and you know, we, we as turkey hunters were raised as if you've got a gobbler with a hen, but you climb all over that hen, you're loud, you're aggressive, you're cutting, you may scare that hen off. She may, you know, she may be a, a dominant hen, but she's kind of the, the quiet type. She may turn around and walk away. But if you communicate politely, like you know, like we as humans like to be communicated, she may come over just to see who you are and what's going on. Yeah. You know, so reading the room is definitely another one. You know, read the room, take temperature, you know, whatever the hell you want to call it. But yeah, uh, definitely. You know, read 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 the room. So that's cool, buddy. Well, yeah. I, I definitely appreciate you coming back on again. It's awesome. I can't wait to team up with you this spring, do some filming great. and hunting wait. together. Can't yes, wait. Yes, sir. Uh, tell everybody where they can find you out on social media. So they can find me. My, my number one social media that I use is Go Wild. I'm just Paul Campbell, C-A-M-P-B-E-L-L. Find me on that. Um, the podcast is the O2 Podcast, Ohio Outdoors Podcast. It's kind of weird how we're, we're listed on some of those. You can find us at the O2 Podcast.com. I am on Instagram. I use that occasionally. Twitter, I use that occasionally. Paul Campbell, 322. So. Awesome, buddy. Well, uh, I appreciate everybody listening and watching on, on the YouTube and all that. But uh, uh, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Go Wild. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. Find me on, uh, and, on the show on several different places. I appreciate everybody listening in. Y'all have a good one.